Hello again, everyone. This is Dolores Cannon with the Metaphysical Hour. And we just got finished with our uh, fourth transformational conference this weekend, and it was absolutely fantastic. The best one we have ever had. You know, our keynote speaker was Helen Reddy, and we brought her in from uh, Australia, and we had a tremendous reception. I wanted it to be good for her. But we had the largest uh, crowd we've ever had at a, at a conference. We had over 400 people. So every year it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And right at the two days before the conference, we had to tar- start turning away the vendors. We had no more room for vendors. So we have nothing but just, we feel really good. It was a lot of work, but we have it finished now. <clears throat> now we're looking forward to next year. Okay, before I... Um, I don't think I can't use the call-in. Seth, can I use the call-in um, pre-line? Okay. All right. I'm going to give out the toll-free number. If anybody wants to call in tonight and ask questions, I wasn't sure if we could do it overseas or not, but the toll-free number anyone wants to call in is 1-888-815-9756, 1-888-815-9756. Okay, and we're calling England tonight, and (laughs) over there it's 1 o'clock in the morning. And our guest, we called and she said she forgot about the show and went to bed. So (laughs) we got her awake, and I hope she's going to be awake enough to do the show. (laughs) I'm I'm awake. (laughs) Okay, you make sure you stay awake now. Okay, our guest is Lucy Pringle, and she's over in England. I've known Lucy for many, many years. We go back a long way. And she's an expert with the crop circles, and she's an an investigator with the crop circles. But I think the main thing, Lucy, is that you fly the plane and go over the crop circles and take the pictures, don't you? Well, I don't actually fly the plane myself. Uh, That's the pilot. The pilot, the pilot flies the plane, plane, and I, well, the helicopter, and I take, I take the pictures. Uh huh. But that's, well, well, I got a little backwards, but it'd be hard to fly the plane and take the pictures. (laughs) I think it might be be very dangerous. (laughs) (laughs) But anyway, I've known Lucy for a long time, and she is right on top of all of this for many, many years. And she does take the pictures. And you used to do a calendar for a while of the pictures, didn't you? Well, I do. I still do. And, uh, in fact, it's, it's going great guns. It's, it seems to be extremely popular and seems to go all around the world, which is just great. Oh, that's wonderful. Yes. But before we go into some of your discoveries, I'd like you to tell people how you got started in all of this in the first place. Um, well, I suppose originally I was, uh, invited to be a founder member of the first academic society uh, investigating this phenomena, which was called the Center for Crop Circle Studies. Mm-hmm. And I came in initially as a dowser and also a channeler. And at that time of my life, I was what you might call very right-brained. And I've always been interested in the unexplained, Ever since I was a child, I think I was probably a a perfectly horrible child forever asking questions, why, how, all the rest. Um, So that was how I I fell into the crop circle scenario quite naturally. And uh, then I found that um, many strange things were happening to me uh, when I went into crop circles and and sat in them. Uh, One particular instance was... Um, I think it was in 1990, I'd been playing tennis one evening, a doubles match, and I'd been standing at the net when somebody, the man on the other side, had hit a very, very hard ball at me, and I'd got it back, but I'd severely damaged my shoulder in the process. 
And that night, when I was trying to clean my teeth, I found I couldn't even get my arm up high enough to clean my teeth properly. So as I was due to fly the next morning, I was really very worried about this. Um, I woke up the next morning, and no, it wasn't a lot better. But I managed to drive my car because it was a gear shift car. And it was my right hand which was damaged. So my right hand just gently rested on the steering wheel doing the steering. And I was particularly excited because this was going to be my very, very first flight over the circles. And flying over the circles, I can tell you, you see them in a way which illustrates them and brings them to life in a way that you don't see when you when you actually visit them on the ground. Um, anyway, we got up in the plane, we soared over the fields, we saw three magnificent uh, pictograms, the largest and the biggest there had ever been, and of course I completely forgot about my shoulder. But then driving home with my sister and a friend of hers, I suddenly realized I, I was in quite a lot of trouble. So we stopped um, at a place called Morstead, where there happened to be a little circle in the field. And we got out, and I went in, and I doused with my pendulum to find a place where there was the strongest energy. Having found this place, I sat down, and it felt wonderful. Mm. And I suddenly realized that there was an energy running through my shoulders. I thought, goodness, this is very strange. <clears throat> and um, I tried. I thought, well, is it really happening? Yes, yes, indeed it was. So I thought to myself, well, I wonder what it's doing. And I tried to lift up my, my arm, which had been hurt, and it lifted up quite easily, no pain whatsoever. <laughs> so I, I called to, I wanted to do some measuring and some dowsing, I called to a friend of mine called Maggie, and I said, Maggie, come and sit here. This is a good place. I didn't tell her what had happened to me in case nothing happened to her. And she sat down, and the moment she sat down, she said, oh, this is wonderful. This is so wonderful, I think I could stay here forever. <laughs> and I said, well, I've got to go off and do some measuring, etc." And when I came back some 20 minutes later, there she was lying flat out in the circle and with a wonderful smile on her face, and she said, look at me. And I said, yes, yes, but, uh, you know, you're lying down, so what? And she was quite cross with me because she has a particular illness called systemic sloederma, which has very nasty side effects. And what I clean forgotten was that one of the side effects had meant that she couldn't lie flat. In fact, she hadn't lain flat for 15 years, and there she was, lying flat in the circle. <laughs> and she couldn't believe it, and nor could I, because two things had happened to us, quite unexpectedly, quite independently, and I suddenly realized that something was going on in the circles for which there was no explanation and for which no investigation had been done. So that started me on my line of research. And that's what I've been doing ever since. Well, you know, Lucy, I was thinking when I first began hearing about the crop circles, was back at the end of the 80s, yes. that was uh, George Wingfield was coming yes. to the States and doing the very first pictures. They were just an ordinary circle. They were. They were. They were. And they, well, yes, and then they had rings around them, and then they evolved from into quintuplets and, and sextuplets, yeah. and, and, and so it went on. And then you got grape shots. And then you got the shaft connecting them. Well, you and know, they've, when, I first, when I first went over there, it was about 1992, and yes. with Alex Bartholomew, and you, you know him. Indeed. And he took me out into my first circles. And I can identify with what you're saying because, you know, I was just so excited to be able to really see them. And you can't really get the full impact from the ground. But it was the same way. We went into this one. It was by Mel Kill at yep. the bottom of Mel Kill where they have the white horse on the side of the hill. And we went in there, and I sat down right in the center of the circle. 
and it was a beautiful, wonderful energy. It was a peaceful day. There wasn't a sound anywhere. And Alex said that he was worried because some people can't take the energy. Some of them get sick. But um, I said, yeah. yeah. As I said, I felt wonderful. I must have been compatible with it. Well, I think over my years of research, and now I think I've got the largest database in the world in Uh this particular area of research. I've got over 700 reports, and they vary. They vary considerably. Some people feel very ill, very nauseous. Um, Other people feel absolutely brilliant, and in fact, just like I was, they're healed. It was a really wonderful, beautiful feeling. Well, there's a very wide spectrum of, of, of effects. And what is one of the most wonderful feelings, I, I always uh, think, is when you go in, you feel as though it's what I call the cathedral effect. Uh, you feel as though you're in another world. You know, uh-huh. when you go into a church, you have this extraordinary feeling of safety and security and peace, and you're in a, in a little sort of um, encapsulated case of safety and even when some of the circles are right overlooking a road a busy road and you see traffic roaring past (coughs) and you sit in the circle (coughs) and you feel as though you're totally divorced from the outside world yes it's 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 the most amazing feeling isn't it yes But, you know, after we had gone in the circles all day long, we went all over the place, and we found one. We went up on Oliver's Castle, and it was the first time anybody had seen this one as we looked down. We were all running around in these, and afterwards, Alex said, well, you must be exhausted. I said, no, you know, I'm tired, but not exhausted. It was as though it was uh, renewing your energy to be in Well, indeed. Yes. Indeed, they can be quite invigorating. Yes. Um, uh, yes, and, and, and many of the time people have, have felt absolutely wonderful. It, it's, again, um, you know, many people when they it's almost like a, a sort of a Damascus, road to Damascus e- experience, rather like people who um, have had out-of-body experiences. Um, they often come back and they're quite changed people, And many of them realize they can heal. I mean, we can all heal, but many of us don't realize we can heal. And it's it's the same with many people when they go into crop circles. Um, They come out changed people. Do you think it has something to do with the person's individual energy? You know, suppose they, they were more of a negative energy. Do you think those are the ones that would get sick from it? No, no, I don't think so at all. Um, I think I think it, it depends on their emotional, uh, metabolic, uh, physical, uh, mental state when they go in, how they relate to the residual force of the, the circle. Yeah. Uh, and also, many of them are on energy lines or ley lines, <clears throat> and you get the interaction with the electromagnetic releases from the energy lines. Mm-hmm. So they're very powerful because all the all the genuine crop circles are on energy lines. Yes, there are power points. Power points. You know, vortexes and power points. That's it. But that's what I was just wondering if the person's individual energy was interacting in some way and causing um, a negative effect that you described earlier. Well, I think so, but they don't have to be particularly negative themselves. Um, I, I think it just happens to be their metabolic rate, which yeah. is, 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 is not uh, in tune with the, with the, the residual force. Mm-hmm. So in the very beginning, then, is when you first began doing the, the, well, the flight. You started out right away with that, then. Oh, I did. Yes, yes, I did, because uh, um, I realized that people wanted to see them from the air. Uh-huh. And there weren't all that many ta- people taking pictures. Busty Taylor was up there taking pictures. Uh, George Wingfield was taking a certain amount. Uh, yeah. Occasionally John Haddington. But uh, no, not many people were. But, but then I, I gradually realized that in order to try and make this, this phenomenon uh, credible, I needed to involve scientists. 
Mm-hmm. And that was when I started to develop the left-hand side of my brain. And, and that was a huge learning curve. Mm-hmm. Well, but you know, you know, Nancy Talbot is a good friend of mine, and she is yes. very much into the scientific part. That's right. She's mostly was, in the brain. <laughs> because I, you was know, talk- so, you know. I was talking to her just the other night. Uh-huh. I have had her on the show several times, and I had her at my conference here because her work is expanding in other directions. But she has always been very left brain and very scientific oriented. That's right, yes. Yes, she's done. She's doing some good work. Uh huh. But like she's had the uh the grain analyzed and the stalks and all of that. Uh have you have you done much of that? With well yes. Uh yes, what what I what I do one year we I collected seeds from inside the formation and control samples from outside. And this was at the Ogborn St. George uh, formation, which was, it was quite beautiful. It was underneath the ridgeway, and it was two miles away from any habitation. And the farmer very kindly took us there in his, in his Land Rover. It was miles away. Uh-huh. And, and uh, when this was, we tested them for protein levels. And they're tested blind. Nobody knows which of the uh, ones from inside or which are the ones from outside the control samples. And the samples from inside showed a 40% higher protein level than the ones outside. Okay. Now, um, that, that is impossible for man to do. Uh, that has to be some other force which can somehow uh, increase the protein content. Well, also, you know, I've heard that the way the nodes on the grain explode, it's almost like a microwave type of energy. Um, yes, that, that, that is what we believe. Um, I think, I think the, the, the theories, and of course there are only theories at the moment, is that the force probably originates in the ionosphere, and that's the area beyond the stratosphere, where there's a huge amount of atmospheric electric, electricity. And then the force spirals down to Earth in, in a sort of um, plasma vortex and hits the ground. It's been estimated uh, with hundreds of thousands of volts per meter, but only for a nanosecond. And if it were for longer than that, it would actually burn the crop. And very occasionally, we do see evidence of scorched, uh, flattened crop inside the circle. And then it softens the plants at the base, and they seem to fall quite naturally, but they fall in these most mysterious shapes. Mm-hmm. Well, I know one thing I noticed when I was, the very first ones I went in, is that the circles are almost like braided rugs. They're so intricate, the way that the grain is intertwined. Yes. Yes, some of the lay is, is absolutely amazing. And, and you say some of it is like herring bones, and other ones sort of little tiny whirling circles, and they, it's quite it's quite beautiful. Well, the one too, um, they had like legs going off, you know, the way the designs are, and the ones that went off from the main circle was underneath the main circle. Yeah, you know, the yeah. End of it, it's almost like the legs were put down before the main circle was. It's it's so confusing. Uh, I remember when dear Ralph Noyes was alive, who was secretary of the Center for Crop Circle Studies, and he had a wonderful brain. And I remember looking, in, <clears throat> looking at the crop circle with him, and we simply couldn't figure out which part uh, came down first. Uh-huh. It, it, it was so confusing. Well, that's what Alex said when we were looking at him. He said, uh, the more you examine these, the more questions you have. <laughs> yes, that's absolutely <laughs> true. But, um, no, I was trying to think, you know, that's just what, it's very aggravating to me when I talk about crop circles and they say, oh, they were all proven to be hoaxes, you know, Doug and Dave. And I said, that is absolutely ridiculous. No person could make these these intricacies. It's absolutely impossible. You know, dragging a board around would flatten them, but it wouldn't make the way they're intertwined and interwoven. 
that's a different kind of a force altogether. Well, yes. I, unfortunately, I think the press, as, as a general whole, um, are, are responsible for the general conception that they're, they're all man-made. Um, they, they seem to give the hoaxes prime time. Uh, uh-huh. Certainly, Doug and Dave story went right around the world, and I did a, I did a, um, a BBC, well, a documentary for the National Geographic a couple of years ago. I saw and, that. Uh, it was really, really good. Oh, no, no that one. No, I think I, I'm. Are you sure? I don't think it was. Well, I'm trying to think of the one where you challenged these people. No, I don't think it was. It wasn't that one. No, no, okay. this one. This one was the most most unfortunate one because I had before I agreed to to take part. I said, who else was going to be interviewed? And they said, well, it was just going to be me, and it was about my scientific work. And I said, okay, that's fine. So long as there's no hoaxing or hoaxes involved. No, no, they said, we promise you. Anyhow. The first one, about the first one then, that you were talking about, were there, did they, you said it didn't turn out that well. Tell us about that one. Uh, Well, anyhow, we started the interview, and and that went on, uh, well, it seemed moderately all right. And um, except they weren't quite so scientifically, um, uh, well, expert as I'd hoped. Anyhow, um, a couple of days later, uh, a rather strange formation appeared. And I rang through to the production company and I said, have you had anything to do with that? And they said, "Um, yes, we commissioned it. We paid the farmer. And we paid the men to do it, paid the hoaxes to do it. And I was furious because they'd gone back completely on their word. And when they showed the film, I was given two, well, wait a second, I was given half a minute's exposure time. Much of what I said was edited so that what I said turned out to look, well, extremely ridiculous. And the hoaxes were given two and a half minutes. Uh huh. And the National Geographic have asked another company to do a film this year, and they asked me to take part, and I've absolutely refused, and because they're going to involve the hoaxes again. And uh, the BBC production also is in touch with me today, wanting to do a film, but again they're going to involve the hoaxes. And I said, no, I do not want to be involved, because hoaxing is not part of the genuine phenomenon. Hoaxes are man-made. And that's not part of the genuine phenomenon. So I'm being very, very selective in anything that I do uh, as a documentary. Yes, I know what you mean. I'm in lots of documentaries also. And you never know until it airs what it's going to be. No, I I really, I don't want to be in them because uh, if only they would do a program which concentrated purely on the genuine phenomenon and the scientific evidence that we've got, it would be an absolute showstopper. Well, you know, I've heard, though, that the BBC, (laughs) they're required to have a skeptic on all of their shows. That's what I was told. (laughs) Well, I don't see why they should. I don't see either. But that's what's happened on mine. At, when it would be aired, there would always be a skeptic in there, and uh, I've never even seen them. They just intertwine all of the editing together. Yes. I mean, if they want to take a subject seriously, um, they, should, they, they shouldn't They should bring in the, um, the part which is, is, is not related, really, because if man-made things are not related to the genuine phenomenon. Mm-hmm. Well, the one uh, documentary that I remember that I was referring to, they had these two men there who had said they had just they were responsible for this beautiful one, and you were challenging them and said, okay, we'll give you an empty feel out here and go and show us how you did it. And ah. they, they refused to do it. That's right. Huh? Yes, yes, that was some time ago. Uh, that was interesting. Yes, I'm, I'm very happy to actually go face-to-face with the hoaxes. Um, that's quite another thing, because then you're actually uh, talking to them. Uh, but when the production company goes on the, on, the, on the sly interviewing them and you have no chance 
who actually take part in that interview with the hoaxes, then I'm not happy. Yeah, I understand what you mean. Yes. There's one I want to bring up. You remember the Juliet set that was right across from Stonehenge? Oh, yes. And you said, you told me that you flew over and there was nothing in the field. And then about, was it five minutes later, you flew back and here was this beautiful uh, formation. I think it has 700 circles in it. It, it had a huge mind. No, no, that's, that's, uh, it, you, you got the basis right, but in okay, fact. Wait, wait, clarify it for me. <laughs> in fact, um, uh, a pilot was flying a photographer round Stonehenge. Yeah. And when you, when you fly, you do quite a wide orbit. And this particular field was the only field opposite Stonehenge on the A303. And there wasn't anything in the field at all, just as you say. And they flew back to Thruxton air, Airfield, which was only about 10 minutes by, by flying time. And when they got there, another pilot wanted to take the airplane. So I think it was probably refueled, and it wouldn't have taken more than about 20, 30 minutes. And he flew back over this field. And there was this huge formation. And um, the, a guard of Stonehenge said it wasn't there that morning. Uh, a gamekeeper said it hadn't been there that morning. And certainly, it was one of the most powerful formations I have ever been in. And I went in there about two days after it had appeared. And I always say to people, if you don't feel well, come out immediately. Well, as I was, I was there with two friends. And as I was walking towards it, I suddenly down, down the tram line, I had this gut feeling, don't go in. And I was oh. longing to go in. Anyhow, for once, I paid attention to myself, and I didn't go in. And these two friends did. They went ahead. And when they came out, they were absolutely pea green. Mm. And they said, oh, we feel terrible. Well, within seconds, they, they were absolutely all right again. But this is what happens quite often, real nausea. And uh, of Chad Deakin was over with his wife and, and a couple of friends, and they came to stay with me there Friday night. And one of the people there actually worked with radiation. And he said he went in, and he said he felt totally irradiated. And he said, I know what it feels like because I work with radiation. Oh. And this was an extraordinary, extraordinary thing. Anyhow, on the Monday, I went back to collect the bottles. Um, I bury little bottles of, of water um, as soon as I can after a particular formation has, has appeared. They're then later they're dug up and they're sent off to a lab, lab to be tested all over the world using different techniques. And we'll talk more about that later. Anyhow, um, we were all in fear and trembling about how we were going to feel. Um, Anyhow, we went in, and we felt absolutely fine. And we thought, well, this is strange, because one moment you feel ill, the next moment you feel absolutely fine. And we decided that thousands of people had been into it over the weekend, and maybe they'd soaked it up the energy like blotting paper. Mm. But I have to tell you another very, very strange story well, relating to this particular formation. I'd given a talk at Alton College, which is fairly close to me, about two months ago. And somebody who'd been at the lecture was taking a taxi somewhere. And she said to the taxi driver, you know, I've had just been to a really fascinating talk on crop circles. And the taxi driver said, oh, oh, have you? She said, I saw one form. Uh, near Stonehenge. All right. <laughs> so this person in, in, in the cab got on to a friend of mine who immediately rang me and said, Lucy, a crop circle has just been seen appearing at Stonehenge. And I said, but there isn't one at Stonehenge this year. <clears throat> in fact, there have only ever been two crop circles near Stonehenge. One was in 1996, the Julia set that we were talking about. And the other was in 2002, which was a lovely ribbons one. So 
I telephoned this taxi driver and I said, please tell me more. When did you see this? Oh, she said it was many years ago. So I then said, well, it was either 2002 or 1996. Oh, she said it must be 1996 because I think her son was getting married or something. So I said, well, please tell me more. What time of day was it? Oh, she said, um, oh, it must have been just after 3 o'clock or soon after 3 o'clock. So I said, oh, my goodness. Uh, Tell me again, what did you see? And she said she'd been driving down the road towards Stonehenge where there was quite a dip. And she said there were a whole lot of cars parked by the side of the road. And one came out and she slipped in. And she said as she was approaching, she saw this cloud. It was like an isolated cloud hovering over the field. And as it hovered, she said she saw this pattern appearing. And as the cloud enlarged, so did the circle. Or maybe the circle enlarged, large, enlarging the cloud. I don't know what it, which, whether it, which one came first. But she said it was quite amazing. So I think this is fascinating, the law is, because it gives us a, even another uh, scrap of evidence about this one forming. Because that's what they always say, no one has seen one formed. So that's ah, the- yes, in my first book, I think I wrote up three people. Uh-huh. About three people seeing them forming. Yep. Uh huh. And I talked to Nancy. Nancy said, no, she has seen <clears throat> one. No, no, I haven't either. Uh, Nancy said she has now. Oh, she has. Oh, she has. Was it in Holland? Probably in Holland. That man, Robert, that young yep. man. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, she said she found, saw one one night when she was working with him. But it, it definitely does have to do with energy. Oh, certainly. This is, this is what we're, we're finding. It's all to do with energies and frequencies. Uh-huh. Hmm. Now, I was trying to think. Um, hmm. Do you want to tell us some more then about what you were doing with the bottles of water? Well, I, I started this again almost 20 years ago because oh. I believe well, water is such a unique substance. Um, it has its own particular properties. It takes more electricity to boil a pint, a, a pint of water than any other liquid. Um, it expands when it when it freezes. It, it's unique in its in its particular behavior. And um, you know, I think the planet is three quarters percent of water, and and so are we. And it also has a spiritual element to it. And much to the ridicule of my Peers, <clears throat> I decided that if I could bury little bottles of water, sterile, sterile bottles filled with water, inside crop circles, almost as soon as they'd appeared, and leave them for two or three days or maybe a week, then go and find them by dowsing, and then send them off to, to laboratories to be tested, um, maybe there might be a difference between the ones buried inside and the ones I buried outside. Okay. Well, we had the most astounding results. Um, the first lot went off to somebody called Dr. Cyril Smith, who uh, is a wonderful healer, and he works with resonances uh, in the north of England. And he found the most dramatic differences between the two. And he did it several times for me. And um, then I sent them to uh, Jacques Benveniste in France. Um, And now he, uh, for maybe some of your listeners, they don't know, but he was a quite extraordinary man. Um, He was the first man to prove that water has a memory, which really takes us into homeopathy. And he he was a very famous scientist. And when he when he put forward this theory, um, he almost lost his government grant because they considered that wasn't mainstream science. Mm -hmm. And he was finding uh, he was doing tests. And these tests were repeated at other laboratories with exactly the same results. 
but still it was not accepted. <clears throat> so I met him one time and he was fascinated by the circles <clears throat> and he was fascinated in my work. So I sent him bottles, uh, again, inside and outside and totally blind so that he wouldn't know which was which. And again, the results were so amazing that he repeated them. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. So they've been tested using many different techniques. Uh, at the moment, we're testing them for trace minerals and, again, getting amazing results, results we don't understand. So I was wondering, what is the difference? You said there was an amazing difference between the two samples. What is the difference between them? Well, in the trace minerals, well, in the resonances, the, <coughs> the, 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 the graph of resonances were, were totally different to the control samples. Um, using trace minerals, we're finding that there's a huge increase in the nitrate content. And Nit nitrate, you said. Nitrate. Okay. And also, in one of them last year, there was, there was an extraordinary uh, increase in the bicarbonate level. And that we simply don't understand, because we don't understand if there's any particular relationship between nitrates and bicarbonates. Hmm. Um, and the increase in the nitrate was so absolutely enormous that we checked the results again, and yes, they were all absolutely right. I mean, such a huge increase, we'd never seen it before. Hmm. And I, work, I do a lot of work with somebody called Jim Lyons. Now, he's a polymath, and he, uh, was, he worked with British Aerospace when they were developing the Harrier Jump Jet. And he's now at York University, and he, he's, he's absolutely brilliant. And he looks at these results, and he couldn't understand them. He just said, well, you know, this is, this is, this is un, 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 inexplicable. Mm. Well, I was thinking of Dr. Emoto's work, but I think that's along a different line. Yes, that again is, is photographing uh, the, the changes in the, the way the atoms behave in, in the water when he um, subjects them to different techniques. Well, but he, he says that the, the thought alone affects the water also. Yes, he does. He, indeed, he does. I mean, if he says, oh, well, I love you or I hate you, Mm -hmm. It seems to change the way the composition of the water behaves. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're trying to, well, we're, you know, in my work too, we're trying to show that the thoughts are things and they do influence uh, greatly. And oh. along the same line, you thought, your thoughts can be shown to affect water. It can affect many things. So much. The power of thought is, is so strong, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But, you know, I did hear that that there was a trace of radiation in the circles because people asked about that. But it, they could barely pick it up on the um, Geiger counters. But it sounds like what you're talking about is immediately after it's formed, there must be a huge amount of radiation and that dissipates. Is that what you think? Well, um, I think uh, we get the uh, electromagnetic field, but that's a moving field. Yeah. Um, so I think it's what you might call the residual effect of the electromagnetic field because, because once the, the, the force is hit, you get the, you get the residual effect of the force. I don't, I don't know about radiation. I've never, I have got a, a little, a little gadget which measures a certain degree of radiation and only once because I, it has the green, little light emitting diodes and the green Light is when everything is normal, then the yellow light when it's sort of bored, changing a bit, and the red, when it goes into red, that is when there's radiation present. And mm -hmm. only once has it ever gone into the red, and that was in a formation down towards Westwoods, oh, many years ago, and it suddenly went into the red, and I then went back to where I thought it was, and it had gone. Whether it was cosmic radiation or not, I just simply don't know. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's so much we don't understand, Dolores. I mean, this is, this is the, 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 the enchantment of this subject, isn't it? Because we're, we're, we're expanding our, our knowledge and our learning as we, as we get more and more involved in it. 
I know. That, to me, is the exciting part. <laughs> I've, I've, the curiosity of it. You know, yes. people, you know, people can say, oh, it's all fake. They have no magic in their life. They have no imagination to no. want to know, you know, what's really out there. <laughs> I know, and so many things get involved in it. Music is involved in it. Um, also, uh, geophysics with uh, somebody called Glenn Broughton and somebody else, I forget who it was, they did geophysical surveys and they found that 98.3% were on, on chalk land in England. Well, and yes. I, was in, I was in America one time and, and a man called Jeff Wilson, I said to him, he's a researcher in, in the States, I said, can you tell me uh, where most of your crop circles appear, and he said on limestone. Well, that has exactly the same properties as chalk. Yeah, because the chalk is where the white horses are, and they have many of them in those areas. <clears throat> That's right. But uh, I've also heard, too, if you take the grain, the seeds from the circles, and plant them, that they, there's a different kind of a plant. I mean, it's like it's deformed or something. It grows differently. Is, is that true? Well, I, a lot of tests have been done on this, and, and they've, they've, they've found that, in fact, the growth is much more robust and, and much more uh, luxurious, if you like, than right. the ones taken from, from outside. But, yes, there seems to be a considerable difference. Uh-huh. That's been done quite, quite regularly with, with exactly the same results. You would think that would prove something to the skeptics right there. But, you know, yeah. They, they think yes. Was- think that no amount of proof will ever be enough for a skeptic anyway. <laughs> no, no, no. No, some people, they, they don't manage to, to open their minds to, to these things. I think mm-hmm. sometimes, I think sometimes it's because they, it's a bit scary. Um, yeah. A lot of people uh, get worried and concerned about things they don't understand. They'd rather, uh, they'd rather stay with what they know. But go back to what you mentioned of music. What did you mean about that? How was music involved? Well, when you get, as we were talking earlier, we're dealing with energies and frequencies. Yeah. And uh, in the complicated crop circles, there's a huge geometric uh, content to them, geometric and mathematical content. And numbers relate to music. And they, both David Kingston and Paul Vige, both of whom very sadly died this year, they were transposing the numbers into music oh. from the crop circles and playing crop circle music, which was absolutely lovely. Okay, because I'd never heard of that part yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah. And also there was one a couple of years ago or three years ago which showed uh, the diatonic ratios, which are the white notes on the piano, the piano, the chord. And uh, music is, is very much related to number. Mm-hmm. It's, it's all based on mathematics. It is, yes. Um, but, you know, I've noticed over the years, like I said, I was first exposed to this in the 80s, probably about the same time you were, and they've become more complex and more beautiful and they're increasingly becoming more complex and different, aren't they? Yes, they seem to have evolved tremendously over the years. And that's why, you know, we, I certainly think there has to be an intelligence behind this. You know, is it, is it, is it the mind of God? What, what, is, what, what is the intelligence? We, we don't know. Um, but uh, it's almost like when you're talking to somebody about a particular subject. And if you see their, their eyes starting to glaze over, uh-huh. then you, you change the subject. Yeah, you know, I know you that well. You don't continue. But if, if they're interested, then you, you go into it in more depth. And it's yeah. almost as though the crop circle force is responding to the interest that is shown in it. Okay. And as more and more interest is shown, so it evolves. Whether that's right or not, I don't know, but that, that, that's my, my theory. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> one thing I, I remember, you know, the people always saying these were done by man. I don't know how many years ago they had a contest over there in England. Oh, yeah. And yeah. for people to make a circle, 
with no sign of anyone going into the field, no tracks or anything, just to see if they could do it and how long it would take. And I think they said they were doing it with ladders and things, and it took like seven hours to make one circle. I was if, there. If I'm correct. Were you were there? I was there. I was there as a spectator. And I, and now, look how ridiculous that is. Seven hours to make one simple circle. Here, the Juliet set had 700 circles of all sizes in it, and you said it formed in, in less than 20 minutes. That, that's, it's incredible. How can they say it's man-made? Well, the, the genuine ones actually form in between about four and seven seconds. Yes. Uh-huh. And here they're trying to do it with ladders and everything, which would be totally visible. For <laughs> I by. know. I know. It, it proved one point, Dolores, but in another way, it was, it was, a, it was a bad mistake. Because a lot of the people, the, the, the groups who went out, because they, they were various groups of people who entered the competition, and yeah. they found that it gave them an, an adrenaline rush. And uh-huh. having done it that night, they then went on to do more. Uh-huh. But you know, the one at Stonehenge there, I said I believed it was real because I was there one night with Alex Bartholomew, and we were trying to get into Stonehenge because there was a group meeting in the circle, and it was late at night, and it was raining, and we were trying to find a way to get in. And he kept telling me he was going to climb over the fence. He didn't know how to get me over the fence. But, you know, we were walking along the fence, and after a while we saw some flashlights coming toward us. And they were guards with dogs, yeah. and they we were watching you just to see what you were going to do. Now, look, this is on a rainy night. How can a huge, enormous 700-circle formation form directly across the road from Stonehenge and the guards wouldn't see anybody out there? I know. Well, that's, that's what they said. They said it wasn't there that morning. Yeah, I mean, that's ridiculous. There's guards there. They would have seen any activity across the road. Indeed, indeed. But wasn't it fascinating that this, this particular taxi driver had seen it actually form? That, that's tremendous. I mean, you're the first person I've ever told on, on the air, so this is breaking news. Okay, we're getting it, breaking news tonight. That's fantastic, Lucy. It certainly is. It's the first, it's the first time I've mentioned it on, on the air at all. And, and I think it's absolutely thrilling because it confirms um, what, well, part of the story that, that we'd already heard. And this, uh-huh. this is additional confirmation. I've always been, in my work, I've been told it's from energy that comes from another dimension. And that's why we don't see it. But yes. this whirling effect definitely is there. So yes. this, this goes along with the idea of a cloud. That, that's really different. It's, it's almost as though... Um, the the intelligence uses all the forces of nature available to it. Mm. Okay. But somebody at our conference we just finished was showing me pictures, I think, of the latest ones that have just come out. And they're no longer circles. They were uh, figures, if I remember. Yes. yes. Yes, strange figures, jellyfish and dragonflies and... Uh, Wonderful ones, a circular one of entwined fishes. Yes. So they're becoming yes. more, more But every fun. year, you know, we get a different theme. Uh huh, yeah, each time is different. Yeah, With, you know, there have been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of circles, and never once has there been a circle which has been identical. They are always different. And, you know, each year we try and imagine what's going to happen the following summer, and we can never match what actually appears in the fields. And, and I think many people don't realize that, in fact, this is a universal phenomenon. And that I think in, uh, three years ago, uh, the latest count was that they have appeared in 54 different countries mm. all over the world. It I more or less began in England, but it has been yes. reported, but not to the extent, I think, the publicity that England has gotten with it. Well, England is a small island, yes. and it's very easy to view them in England. 
Uh, whereas in the States, you know, it's a huge, huge place, and, and they're very scattered. Yeah, and, and they're usually out in the middle of nowhere where most people wouldn't even see them. Yes, yes, indeed, yes. Um, right. I'm watching the clock, Lucy, because well, imagine an hour is almost over. I know, it goes so quickly, doesn't it? Well, it's such a huge, huge and fascinating subject. I know, and I want you to tell people... Uh, how they can contact you. Are You said you are selling your calendars. With the yes, program. yes. May, well, I give them, may I give them my web, website address? You also sell postcards and things too, don't I you? I sell all sorts of things, and I've written three books, and, and it's all wonderful. Uh, Terrific. Sh- you can advertise your books and everything. <laughs> <laughs> may, I, may, may I give you my website address, which is... Definitely, definitely. Tell people how they can get in touch with you. Okay. My website address is www.lucypringle, and that is L-U-C-Y-P-R-I-N-G-L-E, and that's all one word, dot co dot uk www dot lucypringle dot co dot uk and my email address it's very simple is lucypringle again all one word at aol dot com okay and that's l u c y p r i n g l e that's it yeah, that's it, and uh, I hope you get a lot of response. It would be, you know, I'd, I'd love, I'd I've love known, to hear from people. I've known you for many years, and I know you're the real thing. Oh, dear Dolores, we do go back a long, long way, and you've, you've twice come over here to give talks at my little society, Unix. Unfortunately, that had to fold. Uh, oh. We were having more and more members, but we were getting less and less people on the committee. And there was so much work. The more members we had, the more work. And it was very sad. We just had to, to close down. You have to have somebody who runs it. That's the thing. Well, I was running it as best I could, and I had a wonderful secretary, but we needed people to help with the publicity and all the other things. But you're still uh, taking the pictures and flying? Oh, yes, yes. Please visit my website, and you'll see all the pictures from this year. You're very much in the thick of it, that's for sure. (laughs) I am, I am. I'm fascinated by it, and I feel privileged to be a part of it. Oh, yes. And you're you're not going to slow down any time soon. No, no, no. (laughs) Going along even faster. (laughs) I'm the same way. I've got too much to do. We're not going to slow down. (laughs) Indeed. There's so much to do. But Lucy, I really, I'm really happy you came on, and I'm sorry it had to be so late at night, and we woke you up. But not at all, not at all. I'd hardly gone to sleep because I, I go to bed quite late. Okay, it's not, it's well, lovely it was, to hear you. A real honor to have you on tonight. Maybe we can do it again sometime. That would be lovely. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thanks again. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, and uh, good night, everyone. If you enjoyed the show. Check out more of our other videos, and be sure to subscribe and click the like button. Thank you for listening to the Metaphysical Hour with Dolores Cannon.